So I'm going to get uh, rolling and people can roll in as uh, necessary. Um, so today we'll carry on with our stuff on open channel flows. Um, and as usual, we'll do a recap and then we'll start now talking about instead of uniform flows, which we talked about last time, we'll talk about grad what are called gradually varying flows. And then on Friday, we'll talk a little bit about rapidly varying flows. And we talked last time about what those are. Uh, the, the one example that we showed of a hydraulic jump is a, I guess it wants to make noise, is an example of what we'd refer to as a rapidly varying flow. It goes from a, a high velocity downstream uh, at a low depth to a lower velocity, higher velocity upstream at a low depth to a lower velocity downstream at a higher depth. And because the surface of the flow is not parallel to the bed of the stream, uh, we classify that as a varying flow because the depth is varying as you go downstream. That's what it means. And this one, I suppose, would be a rapidly varying flow rather than a gradually varying flow. So we'll talk about gradually varying flows today. And so that's our plan. And I guess the other things I had on here, I guess, does it stop when I hit the space bar? It does. No, it didn't want to do that. Um, I don't know why. I'd forgotten that I'd had these on. I don't know if you saw the movie Chinatown with Jack Nicholson. Um, but Chinatown is based in L.A., and it's all about uh, uh, the Owens Valley, how L.A. gets its water. And Mulholland, I guess, who is the um, uh, mayor, mayor of L.A., I guess, in the time in the 1930s, probably, I'd imagine, when L.A. was just a very small backwater city and to grow it needed water and it needed water from the Owens Valley which is uh, to the northeast of LA and so the whole idea of the the aqueducts which bring water into LA was from the 1930s Chinatown is about the intrigue and the uh, the gangland type intrigue behind the the shenanigans that went on in getting water into LA kind of an interesting movie um, and of course, you know, whole, whole of San Francisco, as you fly into San Francisco, you fly before you get to the coastal range, which San Francisco is on the other side, you, flow, you fly over an aqueduct, which of course is bringing water from the Colorado River, from Colorado, across the Rockies, and uh, into California. Uh, and of course, right now, the big issue in California is, is uh, the drought. Uh, the fact that they haven't had a big snow. Maybe two years ago, they got a reasonable snow, but I think last year may have been a bust, and, I've, and they continue to have, have problems with that. And so if you look, I don't have a picture of the aqueduct flowing, I guess. I guess we could look at, yeah, you can see pictures of it. Uh, images. Yeah, it's quite an amazing uh, construction. Um, all um, concrete lined. You can spot it easily from a plane as you as you start to descend, maybe from a ten thousand feet or so, and uh, just moving water solidly along uh, the channels, the kind of channels that we we're talking about last time for for uniform flows. So that's what we dealt with last time. So we'll get back to what we're going to deal with today. And so today we'll carry on talking about open channel flows. It's probably worthwhile uh, recapping exactly where we're going with this. Um, just to say that in the last four or five weeks, we've been talking about the practical applications, I guess, of fluid mechanics. And the whole essence of fluids is being able to figure out how real fluids, fluids that have viscosity, uh, travel. So Bernoulli is of some use to us, uh, but knowing uh, frictional losses is really the essence of some of these flows in designing pumps. And we've made the point that there are these two regimes. They're divided by a Reynolds number. The Reynolds number of about 2,000 is what splits it from being laminar on one side and turbulent on the other. Um, the, the dependencies of the flow, depending on whether it's laminar or turbulent, uh, are controlled by viscosity in the laminar regime and turbulent in the, uh, and uh, not viscosity in the turbulent regime. So viscosity controls flow here by the drag, if you like, along the side of a cylinder or the inside of a pipe. 
and um, density controls the flow here by the idea that you have this mass that's stagnating on the face of the cylinder and applying a force to it by killing the momentum of this uh, and transferring the momentum to this as a force. Um, it happens for internal flows where we happen to be interested in the velocity uh, that flow goes at because of the influence of shear forces on the pipe. It happens for external flows where we're not interested so much in the flow velocity change around the object, but we are interested in the force that it applies to it because it allows us to be able to design things like um, uh, bridges to or buildings to stand up to the wind loads or um, decks that of bridges that don't uh, uh, vibrate at the wrong resonant frequency or flight structures that don't fall apart. Uh, and then open channel flows is kind of similar to pipe flows where we're interested in the influence of drag on the side of the channel. So drag force on the side of the channel that is added to the fluid just as on the inside of a pipe. And the only difference between pipe flow and open channel flow is the only thing that's driving it is not the pressure, which drives it typically for pipe flow, but gravity. Because there is no, the pressure on the upstream uh, face of the uh, free body that we divide from this is just like the pressure distribution in the swimming pool. So that's kind of where we were going with that. And I guess perhaps to, to cap that off, when we talked about um, uniform flows, we made a couple of points. We talked about the, the Manning formula. I can never remember it, but you should. Um, hydraulic radius to the 2 over 3 times, oops, times the slope of the bed, which is to the half, I think. Right? And if you want to get the volume, then you just multiply the average velocity times the cross-sectional area, and this becomes this. And the other parameters, um, n is a Manning's coefficient, which is a non-dimensional number, usually of the order of a hundredth. Uh, 0 0.01 of that order. K is 1 for all the cases that we'll look at for SI units. It's different if you use English units. Hydraulic radius we defined in terms of um, a perimeter. So hydraulic radius is equal to the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. And so the area is this. And the perimeter is just the, the wetted perimeter that the water flows through. And so knowing what those things are, if you know the slope of the bed, and of course, this, I guess I didn't draw it here, but I, I can draw it, I suppose. The slope of the water for uniform flows is the same as the slope of the bed. And of course, the slope of the bed is L, I think we'll use, and delta Z. And so the slope, 0, is equal to delta Z over L. And uh, we know that the depth of the water, both upstream and downstream, is the same by definition for our uh, uniformly varying flows. dy over dx is equal to 0. And I guess x is probably along, inclined along the length of the bed. So the, the depth here is y1. Depth here is y2, upstream or downstream, I think we call them, yu and yd. And so if they don't change, then the change in y along x obviously is zero. And that is therefore a uniform flow. And as I mentioned, and I guess I'll keep it on this, there's a question on that on the, uh, a week Friday uh, that follows along the lines of something in a previous test. So just look take that into account and, and, and get ready for that. Pretty straightforward. We talked about composite sections and the fact of how to get uh, uh, the sums of different uh, channels. Um, and so you can see that there must be videos that explain that as well. And so what we'll talk about today uh, is we'll go the next step and we'll talk about what we'll refer to as gradually varying flows 
where this change in depth with length along the flow regime is small but not equal to zero. So it's not equal to zero is, is the main thing. And so we need to know a couple of things, or, or our analysis will revolve around two things. It will revolve around wave speeds, which we've talked about, I think, maybe on the first Wednesday that we met. And we'll talk about a new concept, which is specific energy, um, which follows from what we'll talk about today. And I'm pretty sure that what we talk about today, don't put your pencils down, but isn't going to turn up on any kind of evaluations in the class. So if you want to, you can enjoy yourselves by just listening or doing whatever you want to do. So this is the deal. Um, so far, we've dealt with this left-hand side, where the upstream and downstream depths are the same. That means that this free surface of the water directly follows the slope of the, the bottom channel. We can define the hydraulic grade line and then the energy grade line according to the slopes of these. Um, by definition, if the depth of flow here is the same as upstream as downstream, if the velo that means that the velocity is the same just by continuity, and therefore the heights of V squared over 2J G upstream and the same downstream have to be the same. So the energy grade line, the hydraulic grade line, and the slope of the bed will have to be the same. In a non-uniform flow, it means that it's varying uh, from upstream to downstream, but not by very much. The hydraulic jump that we looked at would be called, a, I guess, a rapidly varying flow, uh, and is classified, again, in terms of this um, change in depth as you go downstream. X is along the bed of the, uh, the stream. And so we'll talk about the cases where it changes. It's not parallel to the bed, but it's not non-parallel by very much. And so the concepts that we'll look at, it's a really scribbly drawing, but this is what we've dealt with so far, where dy dx is equal to zero. This is the next one that we'll do, and this may be Friday. It turns out that we can actually define these behaviors in terms of how the depth changes with um, the length along the flow as a function of the slope of the bed, the slope of the free surface, which is this one here, I guess the energy grade line actually, not the free surface, and the fruit number. And we, uh, so we'll perhaps get to that later. So the important thing to realize is that we can define what this is if we know something about the slope of the bed. Uh, we need to know something about the flow to know how the, um, the energy changes as you go upstream and downstream. And if we know the value of the flow velocity, then we know that the Froude number, Froude number, I guess, is the flow velocity divided by g times the depth of flow. And we'll talk about that again today. And it all comes into um, the speed of waves. And so what we'll do is we'll develop these concepts as we go through today. So this is the geometry that we're dealing with. So first things first, wave speeds. We've talked about this. Um, we know something about them. Uh, we didn't um, define it as anything other than uh, defining the absolute magnitudes of them. Um, we made the case that uh, the wave speed in a gas is given by this. Um, the wave speed by a solid is given by the modulus of the solid divided by its density. And so this also works for a liquid. And so the wave speed for a liquid uh, the modulus of water is something like 2 times 10 to the 9 pascals divided by the density of water, which is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And so if you, we've done this before, so 10 to the 9 divided by 1,000 is 10 to the 6. So it's 2 times 10 to the 6, so it ends up being square root of that, I guess. So I think uh, if my math is right, that ends up being 1.4, which is square root 2. Square root 10 to the 6 is 10 to the 3. Uh, it's not, and it's meters per second. And so the speed of sound in water, if you're talking to someone underwater, is something like 1.5 kilometers an hour. Uh, we can do the speed in air, 
I guess it's easier for me to do the speed in air using this equation here. We know that the speed of sound in air is equal to the modulus of air. We know the modulus is equal to the pressure um, at low pressures. And so air pressure is 10 to the 5 pascals. Density of air is roughly 1 kilogram a meter cubed. And so square root of 10 to the 5 is something like, um, it's going to be 10 times 10 to the 4. Square root 10 is 3. So it's 3 times 10 to the 2. Sounds about right, which is 300 meters a second. And I know that number because it's also, a meter a second is about 2 miles an hour, so it's also about 600 miles an hour. And I know that commercial planes fly at about 500 some miles an hour, just below the speed of sound, uh, because it's much more um, fuel efficient to do that, and it's much cheaper to build airplanes that don't go faster than the speed of sound. And of course, 600 miles an hour is why you know that when you see a lightning strike, if you wait six seconds, you know that that lightning strike was a mile away from you. 600 miles an hour, so 60 minutes in an hour, so that's 10 miles a minute, and a minute divided by 10 is 6 seconds. So, so we know that. So surface waves are, are a bit different. Uh, we talked about tsunami before, the fact that the surface wave is equal to gravity, so this, for this planet, times the depth of the wave and left it at that. It turns out that this is quite a, um, a big number. Actually, it wasn't the full story when we talked about that. Uh, I'm not going to go through this derivation. You can do the derivation for how quickly a wave should travel. I'm going to just blow through that. It turns out that the um, equation for a, a wave is this number. Wave speed is equal to square root of g times the depth of flow. Uh, but it's not that way everywhere. For very deep waves relative to the the wavelength between the two crests, it uh, differs from that. And so I guess this graph kind of shows this. This side of the graph, graph would be a channel where the wavelength lambda would be this. And I guess an average depth of this wave, that's not quite average. The mean depth of the wave, I guess, is what we'd be taking, would be y. So this is y, and this is lambda. And in the ocean, uh, the same thing would occur, I guess. You'd have a wave that looked like this other wave, except the depth would be here. And so this would be the, the depth. And so. Uh, for ocean waves, even though we did an example using an ocean wave as an example, we had a one kilometer depth, I think, for the tsunami off the, um, the east coast of Japan. We used a kilometer and we calculated it to be something like 200, 100 meters a second, and it worked out to be quite close to what it really is. Um, we probably shouldn't have quite used that because it's not quite right. But certainly when we're dealing with channel flows, where the wavelength is potentially large compared to the depth, then this relationship actually does hold. And that's the only one that we'll use. And so we can use that to define um, a Froude number, uh, which is what we said before. And the relevance of this is that uh, the velocity at which the wave travels is given by this. Velocity of the wave is equal to gravity times the depth square root. And the other velocity that's in this, so I guess we've called this the celerity wave. C is often used in physics for wave speed not, rather than velocity, so that's why I'm using C. Um, this is the wave, this is the speed of the flow in the channel. And so the rationale for that is that if you look at dropping a pebble into water and you look at the wave train that gets developed by that, then you'd see that these waves move out at the, the wave speed this is actually the wave speed, which is the celerity, C for celerity and C for wave speed. So this is the wave speed. And it'd be absolutely symmetric if you see that. 
If you add a velocity to this water, so in other words, you're standing on the top of a bridge and you're watching the water go underneath you and you drop a pedal, pebble in, you won't see a concentric wave speed, but you'll see if you are making a wave from that spot every single second, you'd see the wave travel out, but because it's trying to go upstream against the current, so there's a current here that's going downstream, this wave is trying to travel upstream. So when the celerity wave speed is exactly equal to the velocity of the flow, in other words, this flow here, then this fruit number is exactly equal to 1, because it's 1 over 1. And you'd see that the ripple trying to go upstream is getting nowhere. It's the same as, I guess, if you think you're throwing a ball, and you can throw it, apply enough force to go at 1 meter a second, you throw it at 1 meter a second, you're throwing it in static air, it will travel at 1 meter a second. If the wind's coming towards you at 1 meter a second and you throw it with the same force, it'll just drop to the ground. And of course, if the wind's coming towards you at 2 meters a second, it will go behind you. And so that's the kind of ideas of exactly what this would look like. So if the wave speed is, if the flow velocity is less than the celerity wave speed, it will look like a, an asymmetric, non concentric circles if you just provide. Uh, a drip dropping every every uh, little while. And if it's going much faster than if this velocity here is greater than the celerity wave speed, then you'll just see these expanding um, wave trains going downstream. And I guess what you could do with this is you could draw a line like this which is the location of the wave front as it travels out as it goes downstream. And so I mentioned that because we, I guess we talked about this last time, but I'll pull this up. I think I did have it here. We talked about a Mach, a Mach cone named for Ernst Mach. Whoops, didn't undo that. And this is the idea here. I'm not sure. Well, you can see. So, so this well, this, these are well-known pictures. So this is a bullet. Uh, I presume it's not a bullet being fired, but it's, uh, oh, it could be, actually. It could be, there's a guy, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Harold Edgerton was the guy's name. He has a very, uh, an excellent book. Uh, maybe he was, a, he was a professor at MIT, 1930s. He used to do these um, capturing static motion of very fast objects uh, with photography. And so he would take pictures of bullets going through apples and doing, I, I don't know if this is a wind tunnel model or this is actually a bullet going past a camera, but you see that there's a, a shock wave that develops here. And the idea is that this bullet or plane is traveling faster than the speed of sound. The only way that the wave that's created, so you, when you drive something through air, you dissipate energy. Friction is dissipated as heat and sound. And so the acoustic wave is sound. The energy is trying to get away from the tip of this, but the bullet is traveling faster than the speed of sound. So if you look at the radius to which the instantaneous disturbance that, that bullet is making as it at this point, it's a very small circle that's here. If you look at the disturbance it made when it was you know, a, a centimeter back, be a big bullet, I guess, if, if that's a centimeter, then the circle would have gone out here. So this drawing here is exactly what the Mach cone is. This is the limit to how far out the um, disturbance has gone. Not very different from our Froude number. Uh, I guess I could, does this get bigger if I do this? Oh, it does. Pretty good. And so this is the idea. So this is the velocity of the plane. This is the speed of sound of the wave going out from the plane. And if the plane's nose is here, um, obviously the, the disturbance will be right at the nose. When the nose of the plane was here and it made a disturbance, in one second, if it took one second to go from here to here, in one second the wave has traveled this far and the plane has traveled this far. And so this, yeah, okay. So this uh, little uh, front here is how far the, the sound wave has traveled away from the plane. If the plane is going really fast, then this vector here will be longer, and this one will be the, still the same length. And so progressively, the Mach cone will get flatter and flatter and flatter 
parallel to the trajectory of the plane. And so what we're looking at when we're looking at um, uh, the Froude number is exactly that. So this little doodad of being able to draw the outline here is kind of like having our plane going upstream against um, a, a moving velocity. So, so you could think of the plane as being static and the velocity of the air moving past it, like in a wind tunnel. If this was a supersonic velocity and this was air, then this would be the effect you'd see. And you see the same effect in water. So anyway, so I spent too long describing that. And we know that the Froude number is the ratio of inertial to gravity forces. And so this is the reason for wanting to know something about this. We said before that when we look at flows, those diagrams we looked at this morning are Reynolds number versus Euler number, basically. Euler number just happens to be the friction factor or the coefficient of drag or the Manning's coefficient, kind of. And so those are two important variables. Reynolds number says something about the uh, flow regime, laminar or turbulent. And the coefficient of drag says something about the forces that are applied on the body. And so we said already, and I didn't repeat it this morning, but I should have done, is that when we're talking about open channel flows, we did the calculation to always say that we're on the right-hand side of the laminar turbulent transition. So for open channel flows, we're always on the east side, the high side of Reynolds number. And Reynolds number, since it's defined in terms of a radius instead of a diameter, is 500 instead of 2,000. But these flows are always turbulent. So it seems that Reynolds number perhaps doesn't matter, right? Because we use Reynolds number to index the kind of flow as to whether it's laminar or turbulent, because this affects the mechanism by which the drag is applied or which the drag on the interior channel is applied. So it seems that Reynolds number is kind of a, a number that we don't have to know, other than the fact that probably all our flows are going to be at Reynolds numbers above the laminar turbulent transition. And so if that's the case, what is the indexing parameter that we'll use to describe these flows? Well, it turns out that the indexing parameter is uh, our Froude number, Froude number. And this allows us to be able to account for the fact that we can have the same volumetric flow rate occurring within a channel as a function uh, which is equal to Q is equal to the depth times the width times the velocity, right? That would be our volumetric flow rate. So you can have the same flow rate going in a channel, but you can have it performing that at a variety of different heights. It could be slow Q2 and Q2 and Q2 uh, are perhaps, no, certainly these two Qs are the same, but it can be a deep flow at a small velocity or a shallow flow at a fast velocity, and both of those satisfy our um, criterion for continuity. And so what we'll do is we'll talk about how we can justify the fact that we can choose between either of those two flows that can occur. And we need to do just a bit of a little bit of math to do it. So I'm not worried about the math, but I'm uh, interested just in the fact that we can define a relationship which is really returning to Bernoulli which is allowing us to look at this geometry. So the geometry is like we had before. Uh, we have an upstream depth and a downstream depth, which now are not the same. We have an upstream velocity and a downstream velocity, which again are not the same. So this line here is not necessarily parallel to this line. And none of the lines are necessarily this parallel to each other. And so we can think about this in terms of Bernoulli equation. And you'll remember that when we talked about Bernoulli, we talked about, I guess my, maybe I should make my pens a bit thicker. We talked about Bernoulli in terms of this idea. We talked about the elevation head. We talked about the pressure head. We talked about the velocity head. That's not straight. And we talked about, on the other side, exactly the same things. 
velocity, pressure, and elevation. And so here we've gone up to this point, but we haven't carried it across. And so the reason for doing that is that now we have this other term. We said that the head losses, the essence of pipe flow, and the essence of channel flow is that there are frictional losses along the bed. So we have this term here. But we also have a magnitude of uh, gravity flow. And so that's not so obvious here. But if you want to think of this term for a pump head, right? remember when we defined Bernoulli, that's kind of this. It's not a pump head, but the fact that the bed is inclined we're rolling a marble down an inclined surface. That's providing energy to that marble. And that's exactly what it's doing to the water here. It's, that's what's providing the pumping that's going downstream. And so the bottom line is that we could add to this a magnitude, define our behavior in terms of Bernoulli, as we have before. So you'll recognize all these terms. If we define the slope of the bed as being the difference in the upstream elevation to the downstream elevation divided by the length over which it occurs. We get the slope of the bed, which we've kind of already defined, but it's defined in terms of these two terms here. So this term and this term is going to get substituted somehow for this. The head loss term is given by uh, this term here, this drop along this length. So in other words, we can think of the slope of this energy grade line as being this slope SF. So I suppose SF is equal to the head loss divided by the length over which it occurs. Direct the analogous to this, right? This is putting energy into the system. This is taking energy out of the system. And so that's what this head loss is here. And so I suppose we would do this. And if we make those substitutions, if we also make the substitutions for the fact that this is equal to y1, and this is equal to y2, we're talking about the pressure on the bottom here, right, uh, for this, not the top. And if we make those substitutions for the slope of the bed being defined in terms of z, the depth of flow is being defined in terms of the pressures, and the energy being put into the system being kind of a pump, but it's really due to the slope of the bed, we get this equation here. And we can write this uh, just by correcting out terms. Uh, we can define it in a variety of different ways. We can include these two terms. If the slope of the energy grade line, whoops, if the slope of this energy grade line is exactly equal to the slope of the bed, then this term is exactly in balance. That means the energy put into the system um, by the drop in gradient of the bed is equal to the amount of friction that's being eaten up in the flow. Then this is the case. And I guess in that particular case, the upstream and downstream depths might be the same because it's a uniform flow. So we can get rid of this term if you want to, and it becomes this. Certainly, if we assume that viscosity is equal to zero, then by definition, if viscosity equals zero, then this head loss, because there's no friction, has to be zero as well. So this term has to be zero. And we would end up with this relationship. And so the interesting thing about this is now that instead of writing it in this form, in terms of the depth upstream and downstream, what we could do is we could write it in terms of the terms that represent the upstream behavior and the down, this, I guess this is the downstream behavior. I guess this would be the upstream by taking this over to the other side, right? So we can define a term which we'll call specific energy, which is just equal to rearranging this equation with the terms for upstream on the, ups, on the upside. So it would be holding down my thing too much, y1 plus v1 squared over 2g is equal to y2 plus v2 squared over 2g. And merely, we're going to call this term here 
the specific energy upstream, and we're going to call this term the specific energy downstream. And we're going to do that because it allows us to do something useful. It allows us to explain why you can get two flow regimes of different depths and different velocities uh, coexisting, if you like. And so this is the, the idea. Let's take this term for specific energy. And let's, instead of writing it in terms of velocity, which we have here, we could write it in terms of volumetric flow rate. But instead of volumetric flow rate for the whole channel, which we've called Q, we can write it in terms of volumetric flow rate per unit width of the flow channel. So if you take a slice of the, down, the flow channel as it goes downstream, which is one meter in width, then we can define the flow rate per one meter width is equal to the volumetric flow rate divided by the width of the channel. Um, the volumetric flow rate is equal to the velocity times the area. So this term is just the area of flow rate. Width of the channel times the depth. That's pretty straightforward. And if we cross out these two terms here, we end up with the flow rate per unit width of the channel is equal to velocity times y. And so if we substitute this term here into this, so in other words, we'd multiply both top and bottom by y squared. And so now v squared y squared is equal to vy squared, which is equal to q squared. Then if we just do that then we and rearrange things, we have this term here. And so this turns out to be a useful term because it defines the energy now, not in terms of the velocity, but in terms of the flow per unit thickness. And so the utility of choosing this flow rate per unit thickness, Q, is that if we have a flow which is um, of this height and is only flowing through this particular area, it will conserve this Q because it will be traveling faster, just like the, the product of velocity times area, which is volumetric flow rate, has to be constant between upstream or downstream. And if the flow was actually equal to this depth, then again, the flow that's going through this total area here would have to be the same value of Q because it's a proportion of this, this width. Proportion. And so for a deep flow or for a shallow flow, the velocities would be different, but the f flow rates per unit width are the same. And our reason for doing that is that we can take this term that really says that the energy that's present upstream and the energy present downstream is given by this equation. We could, um, if we wanted to, we could multiply the right-hand side of this by y squared and multiply this by y squared and this by y squared. This would cross out. And the reason for doing that now is that we can see this, that this equation for uh, energy. If we rearrange it so that 0 equals this term just by taking this over to the right-hand side is we have this uh, cubic equation. And so because it's a cubic equation in y, we have uh, y squared, y cubed, and no y. So it's a cubic equation. There is no y1, but there's y to the power 0. If you want to solve this equation, you get three roots. And so the easiest way for us to do this is to assume for our stream that we have a value of q. If we know what q is, then we could assume that we have a flow that is very shallow. So we're going to plot y on the vertical axis. So when y is 0, it will be no flow. It will be, uh, it'll be a puddle. It will be a, a film of water. And when y is much larger, it will look like this. And so all we need to do is to choose a value of y which goes from 0 to, I don't know, 10 meters. Uh, plug it into this equation. 
take a value of q which is constant, a value of g which is constant, and cycle through all the values of y going from 0 to 10, and we'd find we'd get a curve for q equals constant that looks like this, this black line here. It would be a bad curve, and also this curve here at the bottom. I'm going to throw that away because I don't know. So that would be the curve that you get if you also went to negative values of y. Yeah. These values would be negative, right? And so the interesting thing of doing that is that this means that if you have a specific amount of energy in your system and you make the case that both upstream and downstream, the values of energy you have in both of these places are equivalent to each other, then that means on this curve, this is energy on the bottom line. This line here is a line of constant energy. And we know we can't get negative thicknesses, but we can get these two uh, roots. And these two roots uh, rec identify subcritical flow. and supercritical flow. So this would be a fruit, fraud number um, less than zero, less than one, and this would be a fraud number greater than one. And so if you go back to our kind of sketch that we had here before we did this, right, we're making the case that you could have a deep slow flow or a shallow fast flow. Um, these are the uh, different characteristics, supercritical or subcritical. Supercritical just means that it's uh, larger than the critical Froude number, which is equal to 1. And subcritical means that it's less than that. And physically, what this means, um, if we draw something on the side of it, is that these are the two values of depths that you could have in your flow. And the easiest way to kind of illustrate that, I suppose, is to draw something that looks like, I'm going to draw a little stream on the left-hand side with a, I've drawn these in class before, with a weir on it. And the flow for the upstream part So this would be the upstream depth of flow. This would be the downstream depth of flow. And all it is is, you know, the water. In this case, it's enforced by the fact we have a weir in the case, but this in, in the flow. But this is physically what it means. It means that uh, if we know the amount of energy in our system, and it's conserved both upstream and downstream. Actually, it doesn't have to be conserved. It just makes our analysis here a bit easier if you do that. Then it has a choice to be able to, because the free surface is kind of a free parameter. It's undefined. It could be either flowing very quickly with a shallow depth or very slowly with a deeper depth. And it's represented on this curve by that particular behavior. And this is, I guess you'd call this a bifurcation. So if you had a flow that's going from upstream to downstream, and if you can start off with a small amount of energy and you could slowly increase that, then you'd find out that you kind of started at this point here. So this point here is what we call a critical flow. At this critical flow, the fruit number is exactly equal to 1, this nose. And if you increase the amount of energy from this minimum, so you, I don't know, you put some more energy into the flow maybe by tilting up the base of the, the flow, then it could go um, either this direction or it can go this direction. It has to choose one or the other. Uh, and I guess the, the art of some of the things that we'll do will be choosing which path you could get to. So you, the point is that you can have two potential flows. You have to choose between them, and you have to choose between them based on the physical characteristics of the flow. Do I want to do this? Yeah, let's finish it off. I can do it. So what we might be interested in is really figuring out what the real ordinates of this curve are. This nose, if you like, uh, here. We'd like to be able to define what this critical depth is, at which we have a fruit number of 1. And the easiest way for us to do that is to 
twist this diagram on its side conceptually, right? So this is just a diagram of depth versus energy. So energy is equal to this term here. And so what we could do is we could take this diagram which we've just shown with the nose and we could flip it through 90 degrees so that instead of uh, having y vertically, y is horizontally. That's all we've done. And so from what you know about uh, defining the minimum of functions, the minimum of this function is going to be where the gradient, so where dE dy is equal to zero, right? The definition of this flat line here is where this, you could say it's vertical here, but it's easier to look at it. So I guess this would be infinity. The reciprocal of this would be infinity. But by turning it this way, it gives us this. So you could take the derivative of our expression for energy, which is this. You get this. And this is only 0 when this is equal to the critical value. So the, the value of the depth is where this nose occurs. And yc you can calculate to be uh, equal to the, the minimum energy occurs at 3 times the critical depth divided by 2 just a number. But what it is, is it's defined the ordinates of this place in terms of a, a depth, yc, and a, a, an energy, which is e minimum. And that might be useful to us as we go through the next part of this. And so, yeah, you see some examples here. So next time, perhaps we'll go through, through some examples. I don't have anything else to say today. We can look at, for instance, how you transition from a deep slow flow to a shallow fast flow by going across a ramp. And so you could think about it, not to give the game away, this flow has the constant energy between upstream and downstream. But as you go across this little hump, what you can do is you can transition from being a fast, a slow upstream flow, a deep flow at slow velocity, which must be this part here, if you go over a bump, then you actually, at the same flow rate, you bring yourself down for constant Q equals constant, which is this curve, this one curve here. You hit the nose at this particular bump, and then on the downstream of this, you get the chance that you then end up at this point here so with the same energy in the system. So you can play some games in determining exactly why we get the kinds of flows that we were talking about when we talked about, in this case, this. Not quite got there yet, because this is really a, well, that's, that's not the flow at all. It was this one. So the reason, this is a, a rapidly varying flow, not a, a gradually varying flow. But you see the idea is you can get these different flow regimes. It seems to happen for no reason. Um, it's triggered by something clearly, and I guess we want to answer the question is what is it that's triggering this particular be behavior? And we'll deal with that next time. Okay? So, so that's it so for, day, for today.